Welcome to the Conciliator Guild podcast. Uh, we're going to be looking at the American withdrawal from Afghanistan as an opportunity to get some lessons learned, go a bit deeper into politics and find out how better to do things, to put it as simply as possible. And in that regard, we have with us today, Scott Mann, speaker, trainer, founder of Ro Rooftop Leadership Training, and very interestingly, former Green Beret. Scott, welcome to our podcast. Hey, uh, thanks, John. Most welcome. And Scott, you served in Afghanistan. That's the one of the reasons we have you here and we're speaking with you. There are many others, as I think it's going to become evident as we as we begin to speak. But you served there um, as a Green Beret, etc. So we are very much looking forward to hear your views on what you saw on the ground, everything that you learned about how things could have gone better. I'm sure it was a very difficult mission. We're in 2021, 20 years after 9-11. After your president has made a decision and it's, it's done now. The withdrawal has happened. How do you now look at your presence in that country? How do you feel about, now I'm talking at the big level, that, I mean, look, I don't know Afghanistan well, but from looking at it, the Taliban are very strong. They've, I read, they've taken over 85% of the country. They're now negotiating with the central government of how, I guess, they can all coexist together. What's your sense how, from your experience, from what you learned, as well as what's happened? What's the big takeaway, if there is one? Yeah, I think the big takeaway, I would say, is we did not do our homework on the, the region and the country uh, before we, we stepped into it. And it's kind of that old rule when we were kids, you know, you break it, you buy it. When you go into and you do an intervention like this, I think we have an inherent obligation to, to, to fundamentally seek to understand. We're not gonna understand it all going in and we probably won't understand it much more coming out, but, but we need to have a collective inherent uh, sense of discovery on on what what it actually looks like when you pull it apart what it should look like and and what our role is in that with respect to, to to how the country not just operates now but how it used to operate you know what its history is what worked well what didn't and we didn't do any of that you know we really just rolled in there hot uh, fueled by revenge and retribution and that dominated how we how we how we went in, and we very quickly, you know, we very quickly went down the road from liberator to occupier. And you know, I'll you know at at thirty thousand feet, I think I can tell you a story that characterizes where we missed it. In two thousand and ten, we went back to the district of Maywand, and we took one of the one of the very prominent elder. We helped put him back in that village. He was on the run in uh, Kabul. His name was Abdul Rahman Jabbar, uh, Hero Jabbar. He was he was he was revered by the Pashtuns in this region because of his stand against the Taliban in the 90s. We helped him get back down there, and when he saw what we were doing in Maywand, working you know when, you know, when he, working by with and through, trying to 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 just identify where the civil society, informal civil society shortfalls were, and trying to reconnect with the local government, he wept and he said. This is what we thought you were going to do when you came. And he said, it's too late. And he was killed two years later by a suicide bomber. And he was right. You know, he was right. What lessons did you draw from your time there, from working with the local communities? You have written this terrific book, Game Changers, Going Local to Defeat Violent Extremists. There's so much in it that that is frankly common with the whole approach of the Conciliators Guild anyway, to make sure that all the human factors are attended to. But tell us what is the game changer framework? What because it sounds to me anyway that that's what you distilled out of your time there and now have taken back to your country, in fact. Well, yeah, sure. Thank you. And I, I you know, first of all, I have to say that unfortunately, and it seems to be a trend for my life, that most of these lessons I learned through immense failure. <laughs> um, you know, it, it was... There may be know, no other way to learn than through failure. I, 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 I tend to agree. I, I don't know that it had to be that way. I, I don't know. 
in Afghanistan that we needed to go as far down the road as we did to learn. I, I believe that the institutional lessons were there, certainly for our community um, from Vietnam. You know, we, we had uh, a, a, pretty, a pretty impactful program in Vietnam that special forces were, were using with the Montagnards, the indigenous tribes there, that we could have learned a lot from. And, and frankly, we didn't. Uh, the initial move into Afghanistan, where Green Berets primarily were working by, with, and through Northern Alliance and some Pashto tribes, Pashtun tribes, I believe was the right approach. I think it was, I think it, in looking in hindsight, it was the right way to go. However, I do think that we partnered with at the time, what we thought were, you know, the, the right leaders at, for example, in the Northern Alliance levels, uh, men like Dostum and Atta. Uh, but it, but it turns out that those men were also the very warlords that had led Afghanistan into this state of total disarray and who had lost most of the trust with the rural Pashtun people and the rural Hazaras, Uzbeks and Tajiks. So we partnered right out of the gate with warlords who helped us move the Taliban and Al Qaeda out of the country. But then we positioned at a strategic and policy level those men as ministers and leaders of the country who had very little respect from the people who were living in the cauldron of the rural insurgency. I'll be honest with you. I don't know to this day that there's cognizance over that. Wow. You know, I don't. Mind I, you, I, I, there sorry. are many stories I could also uh tell about di diplomatic stories that where where there's a massive dissonance between high level diplomacy and the realities of a country yeah yeah and and, and unfortunately these these lessons they revealed themselves to us i think what as often as the case is in this country known as the graveyard of empires you know one incremental step one painful step at a time we started to, to see some of these things. But, you know, we were living out in the rural areas, but mostly focused on, you know, attrition, on, on surgical coercion, on, on trying to take the Taliban out of, because Al-Qaeda was, for the most part at this point, was gone. They were pushed into Pakistan. And what you had remaining was the, you know, the remnants of a rural insurgency um, of Taliban holdovers that just needed to be, uh, mopped up, if you will. And, and, and that's where we kind of found ourselves. But the reality was, because we were coming from the top down, uh, I don't think there was real unity of effort or unity of understanding about what the next phase of this campaign was going to look like. You had people in the administration and NATO, frankly, saying, um, we're not going to nation build. That we're not doing nation building. This is about going after the Taliban. But then at the same time, our actions were not reflecting that at all. You were starting to see, you know, we were occupying the very bases that the Soviets occupied. We had close to 100,000 people in the country. So if we weren't doing nation building, I'm not sure what we were doing. Um, and, you know, so there was just, I think, from a unity of effort and established mission, it was not congruent internally and certainly I don't think we gave Afghanistan the respect that it needed as, as a country to really understand its, its workings at a macro and micro level. I, there wasn't a lot of effort put into that. And it was more about how do we, how do we clean this up? How do we, how do we bring some kind of Western um, apparatus into this country as quickly as possible and get our people home? I find it already amazing that you say that the lessons from Vietnam were not learned. But tell us, Scott, about the game changer framework. Tell us about that. So, so there's four. There's really four principles to to the game changers approach that, that again that I put out there at a macro level. One, the first one is I still live by. I try to live by and teach is meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. Um, you know, that's one of the that's to me one of the most important things that we can do in this type of work. And we did not do, um, we tried to, in, a, in, in for example, project a, 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 um, a Western style of the liberal democracy onto a country that was largely a status society 
Um, and, 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 you know, a, a lot of tribal dynamics at play, but not just tribal dynamics, ethnic dynamics. Um, and frankly, the, the informal civil society was immensely broken. And I'd love to come back and talk about that in a, in a bit, because it was something that I believe we totally missed and we're in danger of missing again and again and again. So we weren't, so we did not recognize the damage that had been done to informal civil society. So we weren't meeting people where they were at all. We were meeting them where we wanted them to be, which was, I'm from the government. How do you like me so far? Let's let's get this finger marked with some ink and get you voting, right? Like that's what that's how we were coming. That so so meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. The second one is go local, you know, um, is is what I found. In, in, in terms of if we're going to go into places that are at risk societies uh, where violent extremism is trying to set up shop to project on a global level. OK, so there are places in my assessment in the world where that are conducive to strategic safe haven for global violent extremists. So if you're going to counter those areas and make them inhospitable to that, I believe there is a there ha, there is an approach that must be done that is both ground up and top down. Um, and, and that's what I mean by the go local approach. I believe that has to come from both directions and there has to be a local application without a local application that involves, you know, a more deliberate uh, collective buy-in from, from local populations, it won't work. It, it, it is, it is actually going to go counter to anything that you try to do in terms of stabilizing an area or denying safe haven, it just it, it won't work. It, it is perceived as as a move against an autonomous status society, and you actually become the dark part of the narrative. Um, so that's the second one. Uh, the third one is uh, what I call extreme collaboration. You know, I, I believe that we 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 uh, tend to operate in the defense community in a in a, in a silo. But you know what? Everybody tends to. I think that in and out group behavior is one of those, you know, natural human behaviors. We are social creatures and left to our own devices. We will form our own tribe. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, we'll form our own groups, these, these groups and those in groups and out groups will compete over resources and budget and mission and media attention as violently as any Pashtun confederation. Uh, maybe worse because we have a, we don't know who we are as much as they do in terms of those tribal behaviors. So extreme collaboration is, is essential if we're going to really apply any kind of meaningful um, capacity building or, or, or connections in these at risk areas, we've got to get out of our own way. So how, when you say extreme collaboration, um, I presume you're saying between yourselves and the local communities, and what are some of the qualities of that extreme collaboration? Well, yes, absolutely, um, with ourselves in the local communities. However, I, I believe that that cooperation, collaboration actually falls into the second principle of ground up going local. I, I'm talking more about the diversity of, of, of participants, constituents in this complex arena that might be diplomacy, development, um, nonprofit organizations, uh, media, you know, you've got all of these dogs and cats playing in this arena, all of them thinking that they have the market cornered on the right approach. And all of them loathe to talk to another organization that they have their own biases against. And, and so you have all of these tensions that exist between the constituents that are all there to help in some kind of way. And it ends up becoming, I think, um, not only not only confusing and potentially dangerous, but but very damaging uh, to to the local people who live there. And we don't show up in a way that best represents um, any kind of outside entity that's trying to make a difference. We show up as warring factions trying to fight over the same population that the insurgents are trying to fight for. And it's very unhelpful. And I think it, it's just it, it, it can go to the extreme and people people suffer as a result of it. Um, so how do you find a way to collaborate and build relationships where we can can we all agree, for example, that Afghan civil society, informal civil society is extremely damaged. We don't know the extent of the damage. 
And that if, if we collaborated and actually spoke to one another, we, we have the capability to be, to be in places that other organizations could not be, shine a light on what that, what that decimation looks like, and then hold space while other actors come in and perhaps lend a hand. You know, but this implies a, a level of interagency, interorganizational cooperation that I only saw in my 23 year career one time, which was for about 18 months. And it was during this, this particular operation of Village Stability. There was that extreme collaboration for some period of time. And it was amazing. And so I decided to capture that. What triggered it? What helped make it happen? I think, well, you know, we had we had leaders in place who 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 really saw the need to talk to each other in a way that we had never done. And here's the other thing is I believe that the the Green Beret population made a conscious decision to move off of those fire bases and live in these communities um, in a way that we had not done the entire war. And so we had access and placement in these inside these communities that really no one else had, certainly not the diplomats, not the development folks. <clears throat> we were living there um, shoulder to shoulder in some of the worst, and by worst, I mean, most dangerous places in the country. And I'll just give you a quick example. I got a phone call from one of the teams that was there. This gentleman was a team leader in special forces. He is a farmer. He had grown up farming much like I did. He calls me, he says, sir, you're not going to believe this. You need to get on a chopper out here, what the farmers are doing in this community. So I, I flew out there and he takes me out to this field and the farmers, the young farmers, the young Afghan men are killing the earthworms with their thumb. They're on their hands and knees in a line, killing the earthworms. And, you know, I, I was baffled by that. And, and, and so we brought out um, uh, several folks from USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, which that had never happened before. We brought them out there. Um, we, we, you know, we provided a place for them to live for, you know, three weeks. And they, they really dug into this. They did extension work, basically, agricultural extension work. And what they learned was, you know, by piecing it together, was that the institutional knowledge of farming had always been passed down through oral storytelling. Um, that chain of oral storytelling and institutional knowledge of farming in that community had been broken when the elders from this particular village had been killed and displaced during the Soviet occupation and civil war. These young farmers had grown up in Quetta. They, they had no working knowledge of farming. So when they came back to the farms and we were, um, you know, driving back into the villages at the time. All we saw was these long lines of young Afghan men going back to their villages. We're reporting in the metrics. Everything's perfect. The farmers are returning. The vill- but meanwhile, they're killing the very creatures that, that, that make the soil rich because they thought they ate the crops. Um, and so, you know, it was a level of micro collaboration that allowed us to identify that. And then really good extension work that happened for the next six weeks. And we saw food insecurity completely change in that village um, within, you know, one growing cycle. And there was a very strong level of resistance in that village to, uh, to outside occupation. And don't get me wrong, they were ready for us to go too, which was fine. Um, but the, the point is, Department of Agriculture, U.S. Special Forces working together around something like that, which I had not even met a Department of Agriculture person up until that point in my 20-year career. So that's what I mean by extreme collaboration, building relationships along all aspects of stability well before the crisis occurs. And it sounds a lot like it was the quality, it happened to be the quality of the individuals present who were ready to collaborate with each other, which from my experience as well is critical. Something you can't always control, but it is really the quality of people that that makes or breaks any circumstance in a way. I I talk about that in the book. I think there's two levels to it. One is is one is having an expeditionary mindset, um, you know, willing to get out of the embassy, (laughs) willing to get out of the consulate, willing to get out of the city, you know, go where the pavement ends and spend time there where the water, there's no running water and just really, you know, really live there or at least immerse in it. The other thing is just a mindset that you 
you don't know a lot about what's happening and that you, the only way you're going to truly know a lot is to stand shoulder to shoulder with other people who are trying to figure it out too and trust that. And I don't see much of that these days in that kind of work. I don't know in any community. And then the final one is tell a story that sticks. This, this is the, I, I believe that our, you know, I'm a storyteller. I, I, I've become extremely fond of storytelling in the last decade, but uh, I found that our narrative, you know, at a meta level and also at a micro level, our storytelling capability was non-existent um, in this campaign. And the Taliban's storytelling capability was phenomenal. I really want to discuss this whole story idea with you, Scott. But before going there, there's something else you mention it in your book, and it's a special interest of mine as well in my own work more as a diplomat and mediator. My sense is that um, uh, we're not realistic in politics, in international relations, about time. The amount of time it takes to get anything done, the varying amounts of time that it takes to get A done versus B, of course, all of this is is not helped by the accelerated, almost um, panicked and and maniacal uh, technological world that we live in today. Yeah. But you mentioned that. I mean, I can't imagine doing bottom up work where you're dealing with human beings who take who need time to learn. It's as simple as yeah. that, or to even get to know you. Never mind learn. It's. It, I really think that it, even even though human learning does take a lot of time, that pun intended, um, a lot of us really need to get our minds around the fact that good politics, good human relations and politics, need to be permitted uh, space and time to occur beyond electoral cycles, beyond mission objectives, beyond uh, manipulating the public. Can you comment a bit about that? Before we move on to stories. Yeah, it's a real problem because I, I, I served under, I think it was four administrations in this war, which is unbelievable. But I found them all to be wanting on their grasp of the complexity and nature of the campaign in Afghanistan specifically. Um, and, and that's not just the the heads of these administrations, but, but NATO, um, the policymakers, the parliamentarians, the congressmen, the, the folks that came to visit, they all, for the most part, were extremely wanting in their grasp of the nature of what you just described. But as a whole, I think as a coalition, I think we missed it, too. Um, you know, Henry Maine, gosh, I guess it was it was in the late 1800s. He described, you know, two societies, uh, a contract society and status society. And I talk about these, I think it's in chapter three of Game Changers, but I, I think it's important that we understand that, you know, status society, you know, derives from really, we all come from this is, is a, is a nomadic hunter gatherer society where the as the, the timeless aspects of honor and shame and hospitality and vengeance and feud, uh, you know, the dark sides and the light sides of, of our human endeavors and our relationships uh, exist. You know, we are status creatures. We, we, and that's where we all come from. And, and then contract society is a relatively new, you know, uh, society that was built on the shoulders of status society when we became sedentary about 10,000 years ago and we started domesticating animals and speaking language. And I say that because, you know, what evolved from that, I believe in places, well, all over the, but, but, but certainly in Afghanistan is you have, you know, a mix, right, of, of status society and contract society. And because in the West, we have largely grown up in contract society, there's not much left of status society. And frankly, our own hubris to think that we are no longer connected to our, to our status roots. Um, we're not even aware of it. We're not even aware of those realities that you and, and so many others in the, in, the, in, the, in the human givens world talk about. So we, we go into these places, right, these status, largely status societies where the pavement ends, like southern Afghanistan, and we project the aspects of a contract society, which is emphasis on the individual, uh, punitive justice, uh, free market, you know, and these are all things that we've become accustomed to and we feel comfortable with, but 
in a status society where the group dynamic dominates everything, for example, where, you know, the elders of a, of a jerga are how, you know, um, business gets done, how participatory development happens, conflicts are resolved. When you go in and you advocate a liberal democracy, you are in essence advancing the idea of individualism over the collective. So you just gave the Taliban their narrative. Scott, I, I, I find this, um, this contrast between contract and status society really powerful. It's something to really investigate. I'll just add one dimension to it, which is that um, my sense is, well, having also worked in the East a lot, but also coming from the West, contract societies are highly explicit. They need everything to be stated out and articulated in words, in rules, in regulations. Status societies, as you're describing them, I would suggest are more implicit, where a lot of the rules are unwritten, unsaid. They're understood, though, and they work marvelously, but they're not always made explicit. This also, all of it relates to some fantastic work, work done by Ian McGilchrist about the way our left and right brain works very quickly. The left brain is much more explicit and needs to categorize everything the West and the right brain is more implicit and is willing to accept the unsaid. In fact, it gives it a lot of value. It's a great point. And, you know, I, I read Ian's book and I like much like my work with you. I just really wish we had known each other 10 years ago because I think it, it would have helped inform a lot of things that we were seeing. But we couldn't put we couldn't put a language to it. We couldn't put a grammar to it. We couldn't be explicit about it. Um, but, you know, the other thing about the, that, that, you know, that implicit nature of these outlying areas was we didn't know what to do with that. We, we, we saw these, you know, for example, the, you know, the code in, in, in Pashtun society is known as Pashtun Wali. It is an oral code of, of behavior. But, but, you know, every, every status society has some form, some code like this. And, and we really, John, if I'm being honest, we did not, we did not understand or even respect the, the, the informal civil society code that governed how business was done. <clears throat> but neither did Kabul, neither did the, the embassy, neither did, you know, the West. So there, there wasn't even really, it wasn't even thought of, it was almost viewed as primal or savage. Or, or not appropriate for what we were trying to do in the country. When in reality, it was, looking back, it was the most legitimate form of governance, development, and security. You know, what we were doing with the security, working with local villagers, they called that Arbakai for centuries. The, 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 the Jirga, the, the council of elders in every community, would have a standing arbakai that was kind of like a militia. And whenever the jirga would administer a resolution over a conflict, if there was a dispute with it, they would mobilize the arbakai to enforce the decision. And their secondary role was village stability, village security. And, and the problem was we didn't even dive into that until 2009. Well, that's, that's eight lost years. Um, but Scott, uh, bureaucrats who make uh, develop ideas in capitals, which are thousands of miles away from the village where you were working, and then try to apply them top down, that's kind of an ultimate explicit exercise or or, or contract oriented. Um, but let me turn to to something that's the exact opposite. Let's go back to the idea of stories because those are actually also a tremendous mechanism of learning that's more implicit. You, you can't really unpack a story. You've got to hear it and get it. And if you don't hear it and get it, if you start to overanalyze it and critique it, you're going to take the story apart. But you mentioned just, just 10 minutes ago that you saw the power of stories in Afghanistan. It's one of the principles of your game changer framework. Tell us more about that. What, what did you notice about stories? What's, what kind of stories worked, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, as a child of Appalachia, I grew up with stories. You know, I never understood the power of them consciously, but I grew up around them. And then working in Latin America with these wonderful Green Beret sergeants who were great storytellers. And I, I was mentored by them. And I noticed that 
all of the great Green Berets, and by great, I mean, they were always relatable to the pain of the local people they worked with, and they were relevant to their goals. Like they always were right there um, influencing in a way that was really impressive. They were great storytellers. Um, so when we got into Afghanistan around 2009, and we were trying to, we saw that something wasn't working. And there were more Taliban in the rural areas than when we started. Um, we, we knew that we would be leaving Afghanistan pretty soon. We, we as a community said, we, you know, we've got to get back to our roots. And it was uh, a guy named uh, Seth Jones, who we brought in from Rand, who was a great storyteller. And he, he told us the story of the, of the Musahiban dynasty under King Zahir Shah and, and, and how really up until the 1970s, the Afghans had a, a, both a formal and informal civil society arrangement that had allowed that country to operate pretty darn well. And we had, we had not even examined that precedent when we went into the country. And Seth used storytelling to, to help. See, that was my first conscious observation of story. I thought, wow, he just, he just changed the mind of these prima donna special operators like that by telling them a story. And so as and so we ended up going into these villages and and sitting down with elders. That was kind of my job and getting their perspective on the Musahiban period. What was it like before the Soviets came was one of my favorite questions to ask um, these what remained of the elders who had memory of that time. And that, I mean, it would all, John it was almost like they would go into that trance like state of storytelling and they would go back to another time. And 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 you could see in their storytelling, what life was like in that village where there was relative collective autonomy, the elders handled dispute resolution, participatory development was, was how things got done. I mean, it was, it was amazing and it was fairly consistent. And so once again, storytelling um, helped us understand what right could look like. And we fashioned the village stability program over those stories. And then finally, was we would bring um, parliamentarians, congressmen, um, decision makers out, General Petraeus, out to these rural areas where they would hear these stories and we would tell them stories about what this could look like. And we would use, you know, we might have 25 minutes with this dignitary who is going to go back to their capital, but rather than try to give them PowerPoint, we're telling them the story of where we've been, where we are, and where we could be with this program. And it shifted. I mean, it went to a plan that was hatched on a napkin in a bar in Pentagon City uh, to a $500 million program funded by Congress. And, and, and I'm convinced that, 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 you know, it was the narrative, it was the storytelling that, that happened. Here's where we failed. We did not establish an effective narrative of how this work with Afghanistan would go over the long term. In other words, we didn't paint the picture one stroke at a time through story of what was required of different administrations, different bureaucrats to, as you say, go at the pace of the population, give us the space we need. This society has been at war for 40 years. You know, we're going to have to help them establish relationships with each other, with us, you know, there's there's villages where there's no dispute resolution capability. The Taliban are doing it all. It's going to take decades. We didn't tell that story. And as a result, uh, there was no narrative to inform the decision making inside the Beltway and inside NATO headquarters. And so they created their own. And it was the narrative of, you know, short term gain. It was transactional, explicit and um and, and you probably, see what's happening right now. The withdrawal is a result of that. And probably a lot of inside the Beltway negotiations and, and, and over a million issues beyond Afghanistan. Capacity building, working with, with other nations uh, to address informal civil society issues and civil society issues, I still believe is a, is a noble endeavor. I, I do. I, I believe that there's a, there's a way to do it. I believe that there are there are nations that that legitimately want and need that assistance. I think there's a way to do it respectfully, but we have to respect 
the workings of both contract and status society and understand how they have how they have how they have interlocked over the years and until we do that i think we should be very careful about intervening anywhere because the odds are we're going to do more harm than good well i couldn't agree with you more and the way i put it i'm just reflecting back in my own language is that is that governments um policy level development level international organizations need to be more bifocal when they look at these things yes you have to have plans yes you have to have regulations policies objectives which are all explicit but you you've kind of got to learn a lot more to see the world from the other side the bifocal which is a much more implicit understanding of human nature of human needs of a larger context of culture as you've been saying you know i find a lot of people would agree with what you and i are saying but it doesn't get implemented people forget it as soon as the action kicks in they forget what you and i are both saying at the conciliators guild we're really putting an emphasis on that on the need to kind of balance between you know there's so many metaphors between left and right brain between status um contract society and status society there but, very simply to get a bigger picture more information in as one conducts any political or policy operation um scott this has been i think fantastic i I've, i've certainly learned a lot in speaking to you right now before before we leave i would like to take it back home though you've taken all your lessons and created rooftop leadership training you help people learn how to lead in times of crises which i'm sure a green beret learns to do <laughs> many times over whether in the Andes or Afghanistan tell us a bit about that and and I know you you've you've got a film out most recently you've done you've done theater you've you've approached this from so many interesting ways tell us a bit about what you're doing now well thanks i you know when i came back from the war i found myself in a pretty dark place i had a a really rough transition uh at some point i wound up about 18 months after my retirement in my bedroom closet holding a, a pistol and no intention of coming out and and it was a it was a really really dark place for me i i you know i'm still unpacking it years later um i'm pretty sure it had to do with um you know a loss of purpose as a transitioning veteran um but also a, a, a disconnection from my own narrative you know and and uh thankfully i had some people come into my life uh, at the right time who showed me who reintroduced me to the power of storytelling as a way to heal the brain as a way to calm the nervous system and as a way to bridge um you know the gaps between civil and military uh worlds and so i started studying storytelling the science of it not just the you know not just the in, not just leveraging the instincts of it and i asked myself you know what if i could because i was still searching for my relevance my purpose what if i could take those lessons you know that i learned as a green beret in these trust depleted places of human connect, purpose based human connection the old school skills of you know what i call life and death listening and and nonverbal attunement and 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 narrative competence what if i could what if i could create a body of work around that and and help because as i look at the world today as you and ivan and ian have all pointed out i think we're in trouble i think we're heading down i see indicators in the west that that look very fam- familiar to me in the places i've worked in terms of uh the way we treat each other the violence um the, the the potential organizational collapse that is out there societal collapse um i'm i'm concerned and so i asked myself what if i could and i don't think traditional leaders today to include business leaders or community leaders have what they need to deal with this novel arena they find themselves in that's you know fairly new i don't think how they're trained as leaders gets them there i don't so what's happening is i think they're all kind of slipping into this trance like state of 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 what i call shadow tribalism and these in groups and out groups are feuding as if it were you know 100,000 years ago and 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 they they don't have the requisite skills they need to bridge those trust gaps bring their emotional temperature down and connect narrative competence active listening and so i built the, you know rooftop around that and then on the nonprofit side helping warriors not go where i went using storytelling to heal the brain overcome the trauma and then 
use it as a, as a narrative transportation tool when you're talking to an employer, when you're talking to your child about your trauma, um, when you're trying to help people understand at home the cost of modern war. Um, so we have a nonprofit called The Hero's Journey that trains veterans and family members in storytelling. And most recently, I wrote a play and perform a play called Last Out, Elegy of a Green Beret that has since been turned into a film to be released on Veterans Day to illustrate how storytelling, old school storytelling, can promote understanding, healing, connection in ways that no other medium can. And that's really our aim is to help people understand the cost of modern war. And that film is, is our, our best attempt to do that. Scott, thank you for sharing your story today with us. And you've woven it in beautifully in all the points you've made. Um, I share your view that um, there are many places in the world now that are showing us where the West may be going. This is a very unfortunate statement, but it may also be true. Um, I think the learning that we've touched on today about stories, about, about using different aspects of our mind and spirit to deal with the world politically, um, maybe we can accelerate that learning process. Maybe that's the best we can do to help us all manage better because I, I do think on, on a positive note that most people, most, do want a better life and to manage things better. If they could just maybe slow down their time on Twitter and all the distractions that we all live with every day. But Scott, this was fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Look forward to unpacking some of these Thank ideas you. with you in the future even more. Thank you, John.